Hey everyone, welcome to our 10th episode. I'm Cassandra. And I'm Jessica, and we are Talking True Crime. It's hard to believe we've been doing this for five months already. To our listeners, old and new, thank you very much. A special thanks goes out to Marty. She's left several comments on the Podbean app for us. Thanks, Martha. The bigger we get, the longer we can do this, and the longer we do it, the better it'll get. After this episode, we are going to take a couple weeks off, but don't worry. We will be working on content for you while we're away. Episode 10 this week is on the Toolbox Killers, Bitteker and Norris. These two men were a volatile pair, and they seemed to bring out the worst in each other. They went on to become extremely sadistic serial killers active during the 70s. Lawrence Sigmund Bittiger was born September 27, 1940. He was placed in an orphanage because neither of his parents wanted children. Hearing that word's a little weird for me because now we don't have orphanages. You have the foster care system, but it just yeah. sounds weird and sad. It is weird. You know that place down the corner of Franco School Street? Franco American yeah. was an orphanage. Yeah. They have that hill. Big G's. They took him down. They're going to hell. Uh -oh. He was adopted while still an infant by George Bittiger and his wife. I wasn't able to find the wife's name. George worked in aircraft factories, which meant moving a lot throughout Bittiger's childhood. He was actually born in Pennsylvania, and they would move to Florida, Ohio, and finally find themselves in California. Which, those aren't small moves. I mean, Florida to Ohio it makes you wonder. is probably the closest. It makes you wonder, like, how many places in Pennsylvania did they move? Or was it just yes. one place in Pennsylvania? And I also heard, while watching the episode on them from Wicked Attraction, moving a lot for a child is not the healthiest. Lawrence would have his first run-in with the law at just 12 years old. He was caught shoplifting and arrested. Over the next four years, he would be arrested multiple times for the same thing, shoplifting. He claimed these incidents were due to lack of attention he received as a child, which could or could, could not be true. The family who adopted him loved him, but they had work and stuff to do. Lawrence was said to be extremely intelligent with an IQ of 138, which is near genius level. In federal prison, he was actually given the test people take to become prison guards, kind of just for shits and giggles. Yeah, they just wanted to see. And he scored the highest in recorded history in the federal prison system. Although he was smart, he dropped out of school around 16, 17 years of age because for him, it was boring, which I noticed some kids who are very smart like that and aren't challenged enough. That's why people move up grades, because if a teacher sees you're not being challenged enough, you're not engaged. And a lot of the people that are geniuses don't do well in school because they're not paying attention because it's boring. Yeah, you, you need to either up them a grade or they're too smart for it. Within the year, Bitteker was arrested for auto theft, hit and run, and evading arrest. He was sentenced to the California Youth Authority until he turned 18. At 17, while serving time, he was seen by a psychiatrist who described him as extremely hostile and manipulative. During a separate sentence, Bitteker was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Other things used to describe him were disconnected from reality, unstable with relationships, and an unstable emotional state. Bitteker would be released from the California Youth Authority at 18 years of age. Just days later, August of 1959, he was arrested by the FBI for stealing a car. He was sentenced to 18 months in Oklahoma, but he wouldn't be there long. His behavior got him sent to a medical center. He got released from there early and in December of 1960 was again arrested for burglary and auto theft. He was sentenced to 1 to 15 years, but only served about 2 or 3 of them, and then he was released in 1963. This is a busy guy because he gets arrested many more times in the next 10 years, but in 1974, Lawrence Bitteker was arrested for assault and an attempted murder. He stabbed a grocery store clerk when the young man accused him of stealing. He was stealing. What I also read was the guy who accused him of stealing watched him stick stolen goods down his pants. Oh, I'm sure. I saw you stealing. It wasn't me. Bitteker was convicted on assault with a deadly weapon and sentenced to the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo. Roy Lewis Norris was born February 2nd, 1948 in Colorado. He was born out of wedlock and his parents eventually married to save face. Having an illegitimate or bastard child was looked down on those days. You bastard. Norris's mother was a drug addict and a housewife. His father worked in a scrapyard and was frequently working. I wasn't able to find their names anywhere. Both of us looked for them, but to no avail. It's almost like they made a point not to say them, you know, because everywhere you read... I mean, some people parents, ask not to parents. be put into certain stories, so I guess... Yeah, but you figure someone's going to have a slip of the lip. Due to these issues, Norris was frequently bounced between foster homes and his parents. At 16 years old, while with his parents, Roy began talking to a female family member in a sexual manner. She kicked him out of the house, and she told his father. In turn, his father threatened to beat him. Because of the threat, Norris took his father's car, drove up into the mountains, and tried injecting air into his artery in an attempt to commit suicide. Does air in your artery really work? I don't know if you can do it that way, but I know there's a mechanism on an IV pump that if air gets into the IV line, the pump shuts off, and you have to unhook the IV, drain it until the liquid goes through and the air bubble's gone, and then hook it back up. Because if air gets into your blood system, that can go and stop your heart, because it pumps through your body into your heart. But I don't know if you can just, like, air inject into an air bubble into your vein. I think you would have to be fairly precise with that like you'd have to make sure you're getting a vein not just stabbing yourself and a big enough air bubble yeah like how big i don't know like lawrence roy also dropped out of high school but he enlisted in the navy 
He was stationed in San Diego between 1965 and 1969. He was also deployed to Vietnam in 1969, but he never saw combat. After multiple sexual assaults, Norris was seen by a military psychiatrist. From this evaluation, he was diagnosed with severe schizoid personality and discharged from the Navy. It was also said that Roy had a hard time expressing emotions. Even anger, he would just let it sit and fester. In May of 1970, while out on bail for attempted rape in 1969, Norris attacked another woman. He hit her in the head from behind with a rock, and when she fell, he slammed her head into the ground multiple times. Can you imagine just, like, all of a sudden being hit in the back of the head with a rock? Like, imagine turning around and there's no one there. She survived, and he was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. For this, he did five years at a Tascadero State Hospital as a sex offender. I assumed he was treated for this. Upon release, he was deemed not a danger to others. Just three months after his release, Norris raped a 27-year-old woman. His insurance must have ran out. Kicked him out of the hospital. Oh, probably. This got him sent to the California men's colony for forcible rape. When I read my sources, that's what it said. He sent rape. for forcible Like, that's what he was charged with. Forcible yeah. rape. Yeah. Isn't all rape forcible? Like, not you're people. forcing someone to have sex and they don't want to. All rape is forced rape. Or do they mean, like, assault and rape? Like, you... No, rape I would say... Or... I would say, like... I want to refer to The Handmaid's Tale because I just watched that. They did rape the girls, but it wasn't forcible rape. They were more like manipulated into brainwashed into but thinking. That's, to me, that's still all rape. All is rape forcible. is rape. Well, but I guess that's what they mean. If you have to hold somebody down to do it, that's what. They, that's, yeah, that's a weird charge. Rape is rape. These two twisted souls met in 1977 while both at California Men's Colony. As we know, Norris was in jail for rape, and Bittaker was in for his attempted murder. While serving time, the two bonded over their sadistic fantasies. They actually planned out what they would do during their future murders while they were there. The ideas they came up with included rape, murder, and torture, and they also wanted to attack girls aged 13 through 19. Allegedly, like, one of each age. I don't know what that was about. I thought it was kind of weird, but they were like 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, is that- One of each age. Is that like when I saw on the documentary they had it written down? Yeah, yeah. Like when they got That's what they were talking about in jail, yeah. That's weird. Yeah. The video we were just talking about is, it's actually a good, pretty good show. It's called Wicked Attraction, and there's an episode on them. Yes. So if you want to watch it. That was good. I started watching that. Bittaker was released in November of 1978, and he would get a job as a machinist. Believe it or not, as a machinist, he was making a six-figure income. He could have just, like, been a rich man and moved away. Like, not, you know, yep. buy a nice house, get a nice car, have a nice wife. Norris was released a few months later in January of 1979. When he got out, he moved in with his mother, and he was able to get a job as an electrician because of his military experience. He was an electrician in the military, too. The two men bought a van, a 1977 GMC cargo van. They even gave it a nickname, Murder Mac. With the van, they patrolled the beaches from Redondo to Santa Monica. The men picked up hitchhikers, specifically females. In the beginning, they would let the girls go, but not out of kindness, instead to perfect their technique. Inside the van, they had a bed, tools, clothes, and a cooler for drinks. They used Murder Mac to troll the beaches of California. They did this for about three months. Along the way, they'd take photos of and with the girls. They also found a remote road in the mountains that led to a fenced area. Bittaker cut the lock off and put his own lock on the fence, kind of like claiming that spot as his hideout. On June 4th, 1971... The two men were at Redondo Beach looking for girls to no avail. That was until they saw Lucinda Schaefer. Friends and family call her Cindy. She was walking, I assume home, from a church function that evening. She attended St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Bittaker and Norris offered her a ride home and some pot, and she refused both of them. Intent on getting Lucinda into the van, they drove ahead of her, and Norris got out to hide and wait. When Lucinda passed by the van, Norris grabbed her and dragged her inside. Things like this is, like, stories like this is what makes me, when I used to walk to and from work, because I oh, walked yeah. there, I'd be on the phone during my conversation. I'd be like, oh, hey, I just turned onto such and such street. Yeah. And then I'd make another turn, take another turn and be like, oh, just so you know, I turned onto such and such street. And I usually stayed on the phone almost the whole time. Or at night, I used to call you all the time. Back in these days. They're just ringing the cowbell. Well, not quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> you have to actually go find a payphone. And when you found one, you had to make sure you had a dime. Not a dime bag, but a dime. <laughs> right. You probably you could get it. a dime bag, but. <laughs> well, back to the story. Cindy fought back, but Norris was able to tie and gag her while Bittaker drove to their hideout. Once parked, Bittaker went for a walk while Norris raped Lucinda. When Bittaker was back, Norris was the one to take the walk while Bittaker raped her. The show Wicked Attraction says she didn't cry at all. She only asked if she could pray. Allegedly, the men argued with each other about what to do with her, but eventually Norris attempted to strangle Cindy. He was unable to handle it, ran, and threw up. Instead, Bittaker, being the more dominant of the two, strangled her until she collapsed. She wasn't dead yet, though, so Bittaker wrapped a coat hanger around her neck and twisted it with a pair of vice grips until she stopped convulsing. To dispose of her, they wrapped her in a shower curtain and threw her into the canyon. Then they would continue to prowl for more victims. Cindy's grandmother called the police after she didn't come home that night, but the case went cold because the police had no evidence or leads. So the pliers in the wires and the coat hangers is how Bittaker and Norris got their nickname, the Toolbox Killers. 
just a few weeks later, on July 8th, 1979, the men found 18-year-old Andrea Hall. She was hitchhiking along the Pacific Coast Highway, and some sources say she was going to see her boyfriend. They slowed down in hopes to pick her up, but another car offered her a ride first. Again, intent on getting the girl, Bittaker followed the car to Redondo Beach. When Andrea eventually got out of the car, Bittaker approached her with Norris hiding in the back of the van. She accepted the offer for a ride and also accepted the offer of a drink. As she went to the cooler in the back of the van, Norris jumped out of hiding and attacked her. She fought back, but Norris was able to get the upper hand when he twisted Andrea's arm behind her back. Like Lucinda, she was gagged, tied, and driven to the hideout in the mountains. Once again, Bittaker parked and attacked her. Bittaker raped her twice, Norris once. Allegedly, Norris thought he saw the headlights of a car, so they went to a second location, where Andrea was forced to walk uphill naked and pose for pictures. She was also forced to perform oral sex on Bittaker. After this, they moved again to a third location, and again, Andrea was forced to walk naked. Bittaker then asked Norris to go to the store and go get beer. Of course, Norris listened. I feel like between these two, Bittaker was definitely the boss. Yeah, I thought the same thing as you hear the story. You can see that he's the one, you can tell that he's kind of stepping up. I don't think Norris would have became a murderer. I mean, he'd be a rapist. He was a rapist. Mm. But I don't think he would have ended up murdering anybody had it not been for his relationship with Bittaker. I think he just would have been a rapist. I think you're right on that, but we'll get to some of his characteristics later in the story. Yeah, he's still a shitbag. Norris explains that when he came back, his accomplice was alone and holding Polaroid pictures of Andrea. Bittaker showed Norris these pictures of Andrea, and she looked horrified. The pictures were taken after Bittaker told her he was going to kill her. Somewhere I also read that, I don't know if this was before or after the pictures, he made her, like, give me a re- give me these reasons why I shouldn't kill you right now. And if she gave him a reason, he'd say that that wasn't a good enough reason, no. so she had to come up with another reason. He'd make reason. her beg for it. Yeah, yeah. Because he's gross. It just, like, makes my skin crawl. Bittaker tried to kill her by slamming an ice pick into each of her ears and piercing her brain. The ice pick didn't kill her, though. So Bittaker decided to strangle her instead. Like the first victim, Cindy, they disposed of her by throwing her off the cliff. That also seemed to be, like, one of their things. They just, like, throw them... Yeah, yeah. ...like, canyon cliff, somewhere deep, or, like, long falls. Victims three and four were 13-year-old Jacqueline Leah Lamp, in most places she goes by Leah, and 15-year-old Jackie Doris Gilliam. On September 3rd, the two girls were at a bus stop when they caught the eyes of Bittaker and Norris. So, bus stops, guys, that seems to be the place. Yes, but back then, you gotta remember, that's in the 70s. There were only buses. Seems to be the digs. Back in the 70s, you had to be rich to go on a, on a plane. No, I know, but like, picking people up at bus stops. Now it just seems so like, someone stopped for me at a bus stop, I'd be like, dude, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> I, I know. I've actually been walking and had, had someone stop and be like, oh, do you want to get in? I'll give you a ride. I'm like, fuck off. No. That's a city thing. That's a this city thing. When I was a kid, somebody stops and offer a ride, you look at them to say no, and they're jerking off in their seat. No, he wasn't. He was someone like a couple years older than I was. Like, nice car, like trying to get me in his car. Like, you're a crazy rapist at home. And I know it. <laughs> As usual, the men offered Leah and Jackie a ride, and the girls got in. The men told police later on that the two girls also accepted their offer to smoke pot. Bittaker told the girls they were headed to the beach, but the girls started to protest once they realized they were driving in the wrong direction. He tried to stall the girls and give them some excuse that he was trying to find a place to park, and eventually parked near a tennis court. Still wanting to leave, Leah attempted to open the van door, but before she was able to get out, Norris hit her in the head with a bag of lead weights. I also read somewhere else that it was a baseball bat. There's been a few different things, but he hit her in the head with something heavy and hard. The lead weights sound like it was a a little bag with those fishing weights. You know, those big deep sea fishing weights. Yeah, and that's what it says in one of our books. Wicked Attraction, I think, said a baseball bat. That's why they can't exactly, okay, well, it could have been this or this at an autopsy. Like, a lot of these stories, unfortunately, come from, I know for Bittaker and Norris at least, a lot of this information comes from them. This caused a struggle, but Bittaker and Norris were able to subdue and, du- and duct tape the teens. The men realized there was a potential witness, so Bittaker quickly sped away. Luckily for them, no one called the police. I had heard that it was near the tennis court and there had been somebody on the tennis court who may have saw them dragging her back into the van or when she opened the van to get out, maybe he pulled her back in and Bittaker, or maybe it was Norris, but looked over at the guy and said, oh, she's just having a bad trip or something like that. Yeah. And pulled her back in. I've read that somewhere too. They would drive to their usual spot and this time they kept the girls alive for two days. During all this, they recorded the rape and torture of the two girls. I read that part of it captured Norris raping Jackie and forcing her to roleplay as his cousin. They also stabbed her in the breasts with an ice pick and used the pliers to rip off one of her nipples. I had a hard time reading that. Stabbing your actual breasts? Ouch. The men even took a nap that night, keeping the girls tied up, and continued to carry out their plan the next day. Leah was forced to strip and pose for pictures, and Jackie was forced to walk up the hill naked. They also took pictures of her. It's like part of their MO. They, yeah. you know... Bittaker would try to kill Jackie the same way he did Andrea. He stabbed her in the ear with a nice pick. When this didn't kill her, both Bittaker and Norris took turns strangling her until she was finally dead. They then focused their attention on Leah. To kill her, 
Bittaker started to strangle her, and Norris smashed her in the head several times with a sledgehammer. Um, when I first heard sledgehammer, I'm thinking like this big sledgehammer, but it was a handheld sledgehammer. Yeah, like Still a heavy. mallet size yeah, sledgehammer. I mean, yeah. it was probably four or five pounds. Yeah, but. well, because you, I don't think you could swing a real sledgehammer inside that van without smashing your van to right, pieces. Right. Yeah. They would do again what they did to the others and throw both girls off of a cliff. Apparently, when they found the girls, Jackie still had the ice pick in her head. Both girls were reported missing, but again, the police had no evidence to go on and no witnesses came forward. A couple of weeks later, Sunday, September 30th, Bittaker and Norris were trolling the beaches again. This time it was Robin Robeck who caught their attention. A few sources say it was Robin Robeck and some other sources say that it was Shirley Sanders. I also noticed a discrepancy in when they talk about the guy who we'll talk about later. Whatever source says Robin says Joseph Jackson. Whatever well, source says Shirley, Shirley says, what was that? Other Jimmy, Dalton. Jimmy Dalton. I'm wondering if that's because maybe the guys said, so, like maybe Bittaker and Norris both said something different. Maybe it was something that didn't happen and they're just making up. Me saying this, this is all speculation, but it could just be... It's in the story because it's in the sources of something that happened, but it could have been something they just said, or they could have both said different names to not... Well, it's more likely they said ...coincide their stories, or just, you know what I mean. Right. The men offered Robin a ride. She declined, but they sprayed her with mace and dragged her into the van anyway. She was raped by both men, and due to their carelessness, she was able to escape. She reported the incident to the police, but because she could not identify the men or the license plate, they had a tough time pursuing it. Yeah, so they they did pursue it, but they didn't, again, they didn't have much to go on. I wouldn't say she's not a credible witness, but they don't have pictures to show her, and they don't have a license plate to look at names. Right, and And I'm sure that- I would not be looking back at the car when I run away from the van. (laughs) Um, Right, you're not going to sit there and scribble down a license plate. No. Everything happens so fast, like they say, oh, it was almost like time stood still. No, it's happened really fast. It took a month for the two men to strike again. I assume this was because they probably thought police were coming for them at this point. Oh, Oh, definitely. Like- the a witness at the tennis court saw you, and now you... Let this girl go. Or this girl, a girl got away. Right? Due to your carelessness. Because you were probably fighting with your accomplice about who gets to do God knows what to who. Well, we know who. On October 31st, San Fernando Valley, Bittaker notices 18-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford leaving a Halloween party. He recognized her from a restaurant that she works at that he also frequented. Per usual, he offers Lynette a ride, and she accepts. But this time, they did things a little differently. Instead of waiting to get to the hideout to attack her, they would do things on the move. This attack lasted hours and was audio recorded. In fact, the FBI uses this audio in trainings to kind of desensitize people to some of the stuff you can see. I think it's only a certain part of the FBI, not the whole FBI, oh, right. but like a certain unit. We were able to find a piece of the transcripts, but not the whole thing. And I don't think you're able to find the audio either. Um, I think it's hard to find because one, it was used in a jury trial. And two, that's not something people should want to hear. So I think the FBI keeps the audio for that. Yeah, I can imagine that would be why. Out of respect for the yeah, well, there's certain and tapes. out of respect for the family. Certain things aren't released. No, there's certain things the FBI will never release. It's none of your fucking business. But we are going to go through a bit of the transcripts because it kind of explains what was going on during the attack of Shirley Ledford. It's part of the story. Um, Be aware, it is pretty intense, but we won't be reading the whole thing word for word. It starts by Bittaker saying, say something, girl. And then she responds, what do you want me to say? She cries while he slaps her and tells her to scream louder. In the tape, you hear her being beat and forced to perform oral sex on Bittaker. He forces her to act like she wants it, despite her cries. Bittaker then takes out pliers and he twists at her breasts, nipples, and labia. In response, you hear just high-pitched screaming from Shirley and cries of pain. Through all this, he continues to tell her to scream louder. And at one point, he asks her, tell me what you want, girl. And he says, quote, you want nothing more than for me to come, unquote. He forces her to scream over and over again. In the tape, he's like, scream louder, scream louder, scream louder. Like, that's, I mean, part of why we're not reading it word for word. It would take so long. But a lot of it's very just repetitive beatings and screaming and... At one point, Bittaker asks, Hey girl, you want me to put this pair of pliers up your cunt? Throughout all this, you can hear Shirley scream while she's being beat. Bittaker inserts the pliers into her vagina, which tears her and causes her to scream out in unbearable pain. There's more exchange between Shirley and Bittaker, mostly him asking, Where do you want me to come, baby? Over and over again. In which she replies with, No, come, no, inside, me, no, 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 with screaming and crying in between. He also assaults her rectally with the pliers, which again causes her to tear. It's almost like she was just saying words. She, I mean, how could you comprehend what you're saying or even what he's asking you? At yeah, that point? when you read it in full, she's just screaming out whatever words come out of her mouth first. As he's beating her and assaulting her, he's asking her these questions over and over and over again, screaming at her louder and louder, forcing her to scream louder and louder, like incomprehensible at that point in your brain. Parts of your brain through that much stress are just going to shut off because right. you're in fight or flight mode now. At one point, the recorder is shut off. Norris and Bittaker switch places and Norris turns the recorder back on. Because she was torn up by pliers, he forced her to perform oral sex on him. Norris tells her, make noise there, girl. Scream, or I'll make you scream. And she responds with, I'll scream if you stop hitting me. She continues to scream as Norris tells her, 
Keep it up, baby, as he's beating her. You hear him grab the sledgehammer while Shirley continuously begs and screams, no, no, no. He smashes and breaks her elbow. You hear her screaming and begging. She begs him not to hit her again, but he hits her again and breaks the other elbow. Again, you hear her high-pitched screams of pain as he continues to hit her 25 more times in the elbows. The elbows hurt just to, like, bang on the bureau as you're walking past. The elbows on my kneecap. Aw. You hear Bitteker ask, what's going on? And Norris responds, oh, I'm just beating her elbow with the hammer. I can't even comprehend. Oh, just beating her elbows. Shirley can be heard crying and screaming in the background. The recorder shuts off shortly after. At this point, Shirley was strangled with the wire. Her body was found with the wire still around her neck, severely beaten and bruised, broken bones, and there were deep welts on her wrists and ankles from where she had struggled to get away from the restraints. I read also during this story that her last words to them were, do it, just kill me. Oh yeah, wouldn't you be begging? Oh yeah, it's gonna hurt so much just to recover from all that. If Not you only could that, recover from all that. Like if. If, right? Or just to make it stop. It just, just so it would stop. Reading it and thinking about it, I'm like, I, I almost at one point wondered if we should even like, I was like, this story's just so. But it's part of the story. But I picked it and I started to do it and I had to follow through with it. So here we are. Episode 10, guys. I'd say woot woot, but it seems inappropriate. Yes. We will not woot woot. She was tossed onto the front lawn of a suburban home. She was found by a jogger the next morning. There were no leads in the investigation until a jailhouse snitch came into play. Normally, I wouldn't like a jailhouse snitch. Oh, I never like snitches. You always think they- Not because like, oh, snitches get stitches. But no, that, because- But you- that too. But <laughs> they could just be saying stuff to get time off. They're already in jail. Right. And sometimes they can either exaggerate or take a real story and put somebody else's name in it to suit their benefit or whatever. Anywho, it was in November of 1979 that a man named Joseph Jackson, or in other sources, Jimmy Dalton, would re-enter Norris's life. They had spent some time together while incarcerated in the past. Norris couldn't keep his mouth shut and would tell Jackson of all the things he and Bittiger had been up to over the last five months. He included the details of the abduction and torture of Shirley Ledford. He also claimed that there were other times when they were not successful at convincing the girls to get into their van. On one occasion, the victim was released after being raped by the two. I think maybe he's saying, I didn't see any reports of anybody being actually released, except for for what he says so i think it i think they're talking about somebody who escaped and he's just saying they released him yeah they might be talking about that girl and just trying to make it sound like oh we let her go that girl the september 30th like now they have some compassion and they let her go instead of killing her or they just don't want to sound like a bunch of bumble idiots piece of shit asshole because all the rest of his stuff he's saying doesn't make them sound like a piece of shit asshole definitely Jackson went to his lawyer for advice on what to do with this information. His lawyer told him he, he needed to go to the authorities. So a few days later, Jackson and his attorney went to LA police and gave them the information, who in turn gave the information to Redondo Beach police. Detective Paul Bynum would be assigned to investigate the claims made by Jackson to see if he could collaborate any of the details to any reports of, well, anything. At first, Detective Bynum saw similarities in the stories <clears throat> and reports of missing teens. One of the stories Jackson relayed to the detective stuck out to him. The claim that Bittica had sprayed mace in a woman's face before dragging her into a van where they both raped her matched an incident that he he recalled happened on September 30th. With this connection to the rape in September, the local police department put Norris under surveillance. It didn't take long for them to observe Norris breaking his parole by selling pot, and he was arrested on November 20th, 1979. Also on this day, Bittaker was taken into custody and charged with the September 30th rape. Unfortunately, Robin, some sources say Shirley, could not identify could not identify the two in a police lineup. It didn't matter though. Remember, Norris was caught selling pot and Bittaker was in possession of drugs when he was arrested. Both were charged with a parole violation and a search warrant was issued for Bittaker's residence and van. During the search of the apartment, a couple of Polaroid photos were found. The girls in the photos were identified as Hall and Gilliam, who had been reported missing earlier that year. In the van, investigators found much more incriminating evidence. These things included a sledgehammer, a plastic bag full of lead weights, a book about how to locate police radio frequencies, and a jar of Vaseline. Also in the van, they found two necklaces that were confirmed to belong to women who had been reported missing, and one tape of a young woman screaming and pleading for her life. This woman was Shirley Ledford. Can't imagine the moment the police, never mind everybody who had to listen to it eventually, but the police first popping in that tape to see what it was. Oh, yeah. I couldn't even imagine. They probably did not expect that. They probably couldn't get through the whole thing. I probably would have thrown up. It was Shirley Ledford's mother who actually identified the voice as her daughter, which is heartbreaking. The two men heard on the tape mocking and threatening her while they were obviously torturing her were identified as Lawrence Bittiger and Roy Norris. The disturbing discovery of several bottles filled with some type of acid confirmed that the sadistic nature of their crimes would have just gotten worse. Bittiger later confessed that he had planned on using the acid to torture their next victim. In Norris's apartment, they found Shirley Ledford's bracelet, which was ID'd by her mother. That was taken as a souvenir. Between the two residences, over 500 Polaroid pictures were taken as evidence. But you have to think back to when they were doing their test runs. They were just taking pictures with girls that they didn't do anything with. They were just seeing how far right. they could push it. Kind of doing their own version of profiling of who they can pick out, probably. Yeah, and what things they had to say to get them to do what they wanted them to do. 
On November 30th, Norris, showing visible signs of stress at the preliminary hearing for the September 30th rape, waived his Miranda rights before questioning. Initially, he was asked about the rape of Robin Roback. Then he was asked about the statements he made to Joe Jackson. And finally, he was asked about the evidence recovered from Bitteker's apartment. Of course, Norris denied knowing anything about everything. But when they let him in on the evidence that they had, Norris sang like a bird, making Bitteker out to be the more culpable one in the actual murders. He told Detective Bynum and Deputy DA Stephen Kay that he and Bitteker would drive around places like the Pacific Coast Highway and such, looking for young girls they found attractive. They would randomly approach a young girl, offer her a ride, ask her if she wanted to pose for photographs, or ask her if she wanted to smoke some pot. Norris claims that most of the time they got rejected and could not get the girls into the van, except for four who Norris said climbed right in, later to be murdered, and one, the first, was grabbed by force. Norris admitted to beating Leah Lamp, the youngest victim, with a sledgehammer while Bitteker strangled her. He also admitted to repeatedly hitting Shirley Ledford in the elbow with the same sledgehammer before strangling her. He confirmed a detective's theory that the acid they found was going to be used in the next victim, and he also confessed that Bitteker had gotten more and more deranged and sadistic with each abduction, and that the last victim had just begged them to kill her. In Norris's confession were many things that could be corroborated with the evidence or facts. For instance, he knew the first victim was taken after she left the church and that her shoe fell off during the abduction. He also knew that Shirley Ledford was part Hispanic and that prior to October 1979, Bitteker had asked her on a date in air quotes and she rejected him. I believe that the asking to date was while she was working at the restaurant that he frequented. Yeah. Probably just being a weirdo. She was saying, oh my God, this weirdo's hitting on me and he thinks it's asking her for a date. And she's probably having to be nice because she's a waitress. Yeah. On February 7th, 1980, in a statement to the press, L.A. County Sheriff Peter Pitches announced he was seeking five first-degree murder charges for each of the two men. He also stated that of the 500 pictures confiscated during the execution of the search warrants, 60 women were identified and located unharmed. In fact, most didn't even know they were being photographed. Another 19 were identified as women or young girls who had been reported missing. It should be noted that there is no conclusive evidence to suggest that they were killed by Bitteker and Norris. But I will also mention, around the same time, there were multiple active serial killers in California at that time. I don't remember which. I want to say it's the Hillside Strangler, but there was like two people called that, yeah. so I'm not sure. But one of the active serial killers was arrested, I think a day or two after Shirley was found. One photograph stood out. It depicts an unidentified woman with both men in situations matching those photos found of known victims Andrea Hall, Leah Lamp, and Jackie Gilliam. This single photo implies that there may be other unknown victims that the two men never spoke of. That sounds like one of those things that the detective, even after he retires, that one picture would be something that yeah. he always wanted to pursue. Yeah. Well, never mind having those tapes stuck in your brain. Right. I will say the tapes of Shirley Ledford. I think it was Norris. I had a quote from him somewhere, but he was explaining that the screams you hear in that are nowhere compared to what you would think a human could actually make. Like horror movie actresses have no, like nothing comparable. Yeah, I read that too. With Norris agreeing to testify in exchange for the death penalty to be taken off the table, he brought the investigators to the San Gabriel murder site where the bodies of Leah Lamp and Jackie Gilliam were found. Gilliam still had the ice pick in her ear, as Jessica said earlier. Cindy Schaefer and Andrea Hall have never been found. I think there's actually there's a thing called the Charlie Project, and it's to like help find the bodies yeah. of these girls. I'm not sure how far it went. There's still a website for it, but pretty sad knowing that someone admitted to it, but you don't know where they ended up. Yeah, and if they're throwing people off of cliffs and in ravines and stuff like that, I mean, there's animals and stuff. Bones are going to end up moved. Oh, yeah. And bones do decay after a while in the right circumstance. Bitteker's trial began January 19th, 1981 in Torrance, California before Judge Thomas Fredericks. The prosecutor's star witness, Roy Norris, began testifying on January 22nd as to how he and Bitteker had met in jail and how they had formulated their plan. During questioning, Norris responded that after telling Bitteker about his unsuccessful attempt to abduct and rape a woman in June of 1979, they decided they would be more successful if they worked together. Norris spilled his guts on the stand. His testimony regarding each murder was very detailed. He described the rape of Robeck and the attempted abduction of Jane Mallon, also on September 30th, and another attempted abduction on September 27th. She has not been identified. According to Norris, it was always Bitteker who did the killing. Norris had tried to kill Schaefer, their first victim, but failed, so Bitteker strangled her with a wire hanger. Norris testified that Hall was murdered when he went to the store for beer or something. Bitteker showed Norris a Polaroid of her, and he stated that he had killed her. Even when Norris admitted to repeatedly hitting Leah Lamp in the head with the sledgehammer, he puts Bitteker killing her by strangling her. He did admit to killing Shirley Ledford because Bitteker insisted that he do it. He had not killed anyone to that point. And again, putting the blame on Bitteker, Norris confessed to strangling Ledford with the wire hanger, tightening it with pliers until she stopped moving, much in the same way as the others. Then the two drove to the Sunland and left Ledford's body on someone's front lawn. These two are out of control. They thought they just could never get caught. Several witnesses testified that Bitteker showed them photos of the girls that were found in the motel room. A 17-year-old neighbor girl of Bitteker's, named Christina Drail, told the jury that Bitteker had shown her a Polaroid he had taken of Gilliam and said to her, The girls I get won't talk anymore. Yet another witness, Lloyd Douglas, 
Bideker's cellmate after his arrest in November, said that Bideker talked in much detail of the torture he inflicted on their victims. Bideker bragged that he had stuck an ice pick in Gilliam's breast and then twisted it, with the ice pick still sticking in it. He described pinching them with vice grips and tearing off part of her nipple. So all this is, you know, basically confessions and corroborates the stories that, you know, we get one from the autopsy of where, how they find the girls and stuff, but two, everything Norris is spilling his guts to, other people are saying, oh, well, Bideker told me yeah. the same thing. They thought it was, it's so stupid. They thought they couldn't get caught, but they just couldn't keep their mouth shut. I know. <laughs> Allegedly, Bideker also told Douglas he had done the same to Ledford and beat on her breast, attempting to, quote, beat them back into her chest, unquote. Bideker's defense team argued that Norris was the one who had tortured and killed the girls. They say Bideker had only found out about what Norris had done shortly before he was arrested. Allegedly, Norris told Bideker that he had killed the girls they had encountered and had engaged in sex with. Allegedly consensual. Richard Schutman, a friend of Norris, testified that Norris had often told him of his desires to rape young girls and that the look of terror on their face turned him on. The final witness for the prosecution was Shirley Ledford herself. The prosecution played for the court the 17-minute tape recording of Shirley being tortured and raped over and over. Now understand, I believe this attack was about two hours in whole, and they only have right, 17, in 17 minutes. minutes. Norris testified that Bitteker would play this tape over and over as they drove around. Before playing the tape, Prosecutor Stephen Kay gave a warning to the court, saying, quote, For those who don't know what hell is like, you are about to find out. Unquote. That would be scary right? for someone to say. You don't know what's coming. While the tape played, the jury, the audience, and everyone who was in the room was affected by it. Most were weeping openly, some just dabbing tears from their eyes, and some running out of the courtroom before the tape even finished. All except for Bitteker, who sat there undisturbed and actually smiling all the while. When asked the reporters if tape really needed to be part of the evidence, prosecutor Stephen Kay said, quote, You're darn right it should have been. The jury needed to know what these guys did, unquote. On February 5th, 1981, Bitteker took the stand in his own defense which we usually know is one of the dumbest things <laughs> yeah. you can do. <laughs> yes, it is. He denied knowing anything about Schaefer's abduction and murder and claimed he had paid Andrea Hall to pose for those photos after they agreed he would give her $200 for sex. So not only is he victim blaming, he's saying she was prostituting herself, which yeah. is a disgusting claim. He also claimed Norris walked Andrea into the hills and that when Norris returned, he stated to Bitteker he had told Andrea to find her own way home. He basically said the same thing about the others. And as for Ledford, the story was he paid her to scream for the recorder and that there was no torture when he was around, but that she had been left alone with Norris for some time. As I said before about the tape, Norris and other people who have heard it say there's no way you can pay someone or even a movie actress to make those screams and sounds. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I would never even want to hear it. I would never want to hear anything close to that, but I can only imagine like it almost, I can't even it, it almost to me feels like it would be unintelligible. Norris was sentenced to 45 years with a minimum of 30 served before parole. In 2010, he was eligible for parole, but was denied. Stephen Kay was determined to get the death penalty for Bitteker. Bitteker was eventually found guilty of the five murders and 21 other related charges on March 24, 1981. He was sentenced to death. Neither Norris or Bitteker ever made it out of prison, not by parole or the electric chair. Or any other means of death penalty, unfortunately. Bitteker died in prison on December 13, 2019, at the age of 79, while awaiting execution. Norris, he died as a prisoner in a medical facility on February 24, 2020. He was 72. They both died of natural causes. Which is unfortunate, because, I mean, I mean, they were going to die anyways them. with the death penalty, but, right, but they deserve it. to see them get it. Which is also kind of... I don't know. That's also weird to me. Like, I don't, I don't want to see any human die. I mean, you're a shitty person and I get that you deserve the death penalty, but I don't want to see it. I read somewhere that the prisoner that's being executed is allowed to have people there, whether it be family or whatever. I think yeah. they're allowed like five guests. Bitteker was going to auction off his five seats. Yeah, I saw online someone auctioning off his um, arrest records. Yeah. It's like, that's disgusting. Yeah. Shouldn't make money off that. Not so fun fact. On average, there are 50 active serial killers in the United States. But some people state that due to the constant, you know, cameras, social media, it, it goes down. It's been going down. I'm sure it has. Which I mean, is great. I think that even if there are still serial killers, we're not going to see the high body counts anymore. Oh, no. Because there's too much DNA. They're going to be caught quicker than that. It's not going to be like 40 years before they find a serial no. killer. I mean, one would hope. And that's the end of episode 10. It's hard to think about how many sadistic people are really around us. Yeah. Scary. Scary, but I'm still going to listen and watch oh, yeah. and record yes. and read. But stay vigilant and stay safe. We'll put photos up of the victims on our social media like we usually do. We hope you enjoyed this week's show. As always, please share and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Another huge help for the podcast is to leave a five-star review on either iTunes or Stitcher.com. If there's anything you want us to cover, let us know. If you have any questions about the cases we cover, also let us know. And if you find that we've made a mistake, you can let us know that too. We would love to hear from you guys, especially on, you know, what type of content you want to hear. We'll help us find cases, new cases, new things to research. Or if you just have questions about us, we'll do some question and answers. 
And again, we'll be off for a couple of weeks, but we will be working on getting content out for you guys. You know, in the last couple months, life's just kind of been weird and finally caught up to us. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. See you in a couple of weeks. We are Talking True Crime.